So, uh, what I want to say is, for those that are still here, and those that are still watching online, if you're still here, then you got what it takes, because it's, it's really a tough class. Once you start getting in to this, and start getting into the face-to-face -face stuff, you start getting into the I am not stuff, and we start diving into all that, what happens is as this starts getting touched on, it starts pulling stuff to the surface. You start, it just starts pulling stuff out, and as it comes out, as it's flowing out of you, you will just be angry. You'll just be frustrated. You'll just be nervous or anxious or I don't fit. There were so many times I felt like I just didn't fit anymore. I just didn't fit in my skin. I didn't fit. I didn't know what was going on. And it's because as all this stuff starts getting dealt with, you just go through a time. But when it starts getting dealt with and, 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 and coming out, there's, there's freedom, there's clarity, there's clearness that comes out on the other side of that. Um, at one point, I brought up a question in one of the live groups I was going to, and it was because I was going through at that time. I said, which is um, easier to deal with and less painful, the death of self or the death of a loved one? Because... It's the death of self that is so painful. And by self, I mean the ego, the egoic mind. The egoic mind that tries to hold on to its identity, which is a false identity. That false identity does not want to die. That's why Jesus said, um, he who tries to hang on to his life is going to lose it. But he that loses his life is going to find it. That's exactly what it is. It's not about a physical death. It's about an egoic mind, ego mind death. That's the death he's talking about. Because there's a union that begins to happen here. And what I have discovered in my face-to-face -face time, when I would come here and I'd get in my face-to-face -face time, um, I could start seeing myself, but I didn't like what I saw. That's why death to self was so hard and so painful. Because you start seeing yourself. And I would sit there, I would, I'd, I'd walk through the kitchen or whatever, and then this face-to-face -face unveiled. I'd just do the unveiled face-to-face. -face. This is just me. And I'd begin to see myself and just go like, man, what a piece of crap. But, <laughs> Pop would say, but you don't see you the way I see you. I'm like, but I have all this crap. And he says, that's your opinion of it. That's not my opinion of it. You know? So we start to see ourselves. That's why if you're still in this class, you've endured enough to know that, yeah, there's going to be tough. That's why I said it was a tough week. It was a, a tough month. It's because it's stuff is just being dealt with and coming up. So endure to the end. That's why Jesus says those that endure to the end shall find their victory. How many people bail out before they get to the end in the midst of all of this scuba being dealt with and you just can't take it anymore and you, and you bail out and say, it's, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. And you bail out before you start having the victory. But, right here, deeper in you than all of your crap is that river of living water. It's that hook and he just does that. He's like, just let you run for a while. Let you run with your ego and try and run from it. And then he starts pulling you in. And there will be a time you come back again and you try it again. And you go as far as you can. And then you feel like running and you stop and you walk away. But he keeps pulling you back because he knows on the other side of all that school blah is the freedom. That's where the freedom is. The truth the life and the way. And that's where the freedom is. And it is for freedom. That always got me. He said it is for freedom that he has set us free. He didn't set us free to go work for him. He set us free so that we would be free. And it's in our freedom 
that we find ourselves loving him more and desiring to be with him more. Scripture says that um, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And what I have discovered is that when I delight myself in him, my desire for him grows. And so what does he do? He gives me the desire of my heart, which is what? More of him. And then as I get more of him, my desire for him grows. And what does he do? He gives me the desire of my heart, which is what? More of him. It's like this huge setup that he does that just keep pulling us closer and closer into union and oneness with him because he knows that all of this, all of this scuba, it's not hindering him. It's not hindering anybody but me. That's who it's hindering. That's who is stopping. So he wants me to be free so that I will have the freedom to choose. It is for freedom that he set us free. So, glad you guys are all still here. <laughs> Week eight, whatever it is now, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a journey. It's a journey. All right. Praise God, Father. We thank you, Papa. We thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for bringing us here together. We thank you that you were here before we got here and that you've just invited us to what you are doing. Help us to let go of everything we've been holding on to. Help us to turn our focus, our eyes, our attention. Help us to just turn our hearts, our ears, our minds to you. Be the light in our darkness. Help us to shake it off and be free and enjoy this time with you. We thank you, Pop. Amen. All right, so we are on part two, session three. And if you guys remember, I did this last time. The individual, you are a trinity inside of you is the trinity. So you are made up of the trinity, inside of a trinity, inside of a trinity, inside of the trinity. Inside of the trinity. So you have the trinity inside of you in here. And the trinity spirit, so yeah, you are body, soul, and spirit. Body, individual, humanity, and creation. You, human race, all of creation. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. It's what you think, how you feel about what you think, and what you do about what you think. And then your spirit is the trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. That's your trinity. So that is you. That is you. Whether you believe it or not, that is you. Right here inside of you. That is you. So, um, okay, I'm going to do this one. This is good. This is really good. So this right here, this is a membrane. Or we could say it's the body. All right? And then this in here, that is the atom. Or we could call it the soul. This in here is the nucleus. Or we call it the spirit. Now, why is this so fun? Let me tell you. Can you that was a Friday drive? at first, yeah. Can you we pass one to, to everybody across there? Yeah. I said it looked before you wrote the nucleus, it looked like a donut. <laughs> donut? Yeah, donuts on the brain. Cookies, donuts, and fried eggs. Come on. Come on. All right, so here it is. Now, what I, what's, what I want you to kind of notice is, okay, membrane, body, soul is the atom, spirit is the nucleus, 
Now, let's read about the atom and how interesting this really is. Here it is. What is inside an atom nucleus? Atom nuclei consist of electrically positive protons and electrically neutral neutrons. These are held together by the strongest known fundamental force called the strong force. The nucleus makes up much less than 0.01% of the volume of the atom, but typically contains more than 99.9% .9 of the mass of the atom. This great force is what holds the cell together. So, this nucleus is less than 0.1% of the size of the atom, but this makes up the mass, is incredibly dense, and what it makes up, um, and it's what this nucleus is what holds the atom together. And this nucleus is of such great power. It's, it's what it, say, it says, uh, this, it's the strong force. The strongest known fundamental force. That nucleus is the powerhouse. There is nothing stronger that they have found in the universe than the nucleus of an atom. That is intriguing. That's why when they split the atom, it became the atom bomb, and it knocked out a city. Huge when they did that, because they split it. They split that power, and it destroyed an entire huge, massive city by doing that, because that's how much power is in that little tiny thing. So now when you compare it over here, you start to see the resemblance here of what's going on with this atom. Okay, let's keep going. Nuclei facts. A typical grain of sand contains more than 10 million trillion nuclei. So, a grain of sand contains 10 million trillion of those. That's how small that thing is. It's, it's so small than a grain of sand, but the power that it contains can destroy a city. That's the power of it. The nucleus accounts for more than 99.9994% of the total atomic mass, or mass, but occupies less than one-tenth of a trillion of the atomic volume. The nuclei have approximately the same density. If the moon was smashed to the same density, it would fit inside Yankee Stadium. So shrinking the moon to the same density as this little bitty thing would fit, the moon would fit inside a Yankee Stadium. The moon, shrunk down, smashed down, would fit inside Yankee Stadium. That's how small this thing is and how powerful and how dense this thing is, this nuclei. So incredible. The small nuclei hold particles so small that our strongest and most precise equipment cannot see. At the same time, they hold the strongest force ever in the empty spaces along with super tiny particles called quarks. Their quarks speed around in these empty spaces at the speed of light. So, Inside this little bitty thing that's smaller than a grain of sand, there's even smaller particles in there. And they can't even measure the small stuff that's inside the nuclei. And inside the nuclei are the quarks, which speed around inside the empty space at the speed of light. That is fast. That is a living thing inside the nuclei with that much power and that much force. Okay, the atom nucleus creates the force required to keep the atom together and in order. So it's the nuclei that keeps the entire atom held together. It is the heaviest part of the atom and is very dense. The size of the nucleus against the whole atom is like a marble in a football field. You start to see the size here? The bonds get more and more complicated in different situations. Nevertheless, one thing remains constant in all of these bonds. Electrons are still dispersed in a relative huge cloud 
around a very dense nucleus, and there is still much empty space. The electric fields and the electron clouds hold this vast emptiness together. Scientists estimate the average cell, the average cell, think about a cell on your, on your arm or something, contains 100 trillion atoms. The number of atoms per cell is about the same as the number of cells in your body. Think about how many cells you got in your body. <laughs> and that's how many atoms are in a cell. How minute and how powerful, and the power, the greatest force known is inside the atoms of that. Incredible. And then this is a picture of a cell where they've, they've, they've shot it down to see the nucleus and the, the electrons and stuff flying around it. Uh, science is continuing to discover more inside the emptiness of the nucleus. So now, what does all this say? Let's go down and look at what Scripture says. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by or in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Mm -hmm. He is the creator and sustainer of everything. So, inside of every atom, there is Christ holding it together. He is that strong force that is holding the atom together. So now, put this in perspective. Christ is in all the strong force inside the nucleus that holds everything together. So there's a nuclei inside of every atom. There's atoms in cells. So when we look at this chair or this table, we know that there are cells on this table, which means the force of Christ inside the nuclei, inside the atom, inside the cell, holds this table together. Christ holds this table together from inside this table. But now, do we worship the table because Christ is in it? No. But we worship Christ because He holds the table together. Because He holds everything together. Christ is that strong force that holds everything together. Every cell of your body, Christ permeates through every cell in your body. So when you start looking at this, you are a body, soul, spirit. Well, in your body is Christ. Holding your body together is Christ. You have a spirit and your soul work together. And that's where the mistake came with, within the garden, <clears throat> is the soul of Adam and Eve stopped working with the spirit of Father. And, and, and Christ. So that's where we come into FaceTime here, starts getting your soul, because see, here's, here's, your, here's your body. That's that membrane that holds your soul and your, and your spirit all in here. So just the membrane. But in here is the soul that holds all the memories, all the hurts, all the pains, all the laughter, all the fun, all the likes, all the dislikes. It holds your mind, your will, and your emotions in here. So this is what you think, how you feel about what you think, and what you do about what you think. That's why emotions, they put things in motion. That's what you do about how you feel about what just happened. So something happens, quick thought, and an emotion. Which, which ignites your will to go do something. So you react to something based on what your mind remembers and how you feel about what you remember. Then your will steps in and causes a reaction. So when we find ourselves reacting to a situation and when then we go, why did I do that? We know it's based on a memory that we have a bad memory about an event. And it doesn't have to be the exact same thing. 
It could be something that reminds you of that. It could be the smell of oranges. But something happened when you were little involving oranges, or there was a smell of oranges, or it could have been pine salt cleaner, and something happened around that, and it was a traumatic little situation you were in when you were real little, and now when you smell pine salt, you don't know why, but you're mad. But you don't know what's the pine salt. You just know there are certain buildings or certain places you go or certain houses you visit where maybe they use pine salt and you find yourself getting angry in those situations and you don't know why and you can't figure out why because it's all tied to a memory of something that happened and that smell is triggering a memory which is putting your emotions and your will into an action. Is that making sense? Yes. Okay. So, um, I was listening to Thomas Keating, um, and he was telling the story of a little uh, infant, or this nurse, telling the story of this nurse that worked in pediatric ward in a hospital. And a little, a little baby was born, and um, the nurse put it up for the mother to, to breastfeed, and the little, the little guy didn't want nothing to do with it, wouldn't latch on, wasn't eating nothing. So the nurse was like, well, we got to figure out what we're going to do, how are we going to get him to start eating? Um, and then she asked the, the mother, she said, well, can we do an experiment? And the mother said, okay, yeah. So there was another mama there that had a brand new infant, and her baby was eating well, very well. So we knew that the mother knew how to feed and all that. So they took the little guy that wasn't eating over to the mother that was feeding, that knew how it was feeding her own baby, and the baby latched on and started eating. So now, where's the breakdown? It's not that the baby doesn't know how to eat, because the baby just proved the baby knows how to eat. So where's the breakdown? So the nurse started talking to the mom to try to figure out where this breakdown is, because we've got to fix this problem. Uh, formerly wasn't as, 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 as prevalent then as it is now. So we've got to fix this problem so this little guy can eat. And as she's talking to the mom, she finds out that when that baby, before he was born, like third or four months in, her and her husband started talking about having an abortion with that baby. So before the baby was born, the baby sensed that, heard that conversation. That wrapped around the baby's little psyche and little emotions, so when it was time to feed, he already felt rejected by that mother, so he wouldn't latch on to eat. Powerful stuff happens in our memories that we have no idea how much they rule us. That's why it's so important we get in here and we do our work, we do our homework to get this thing cleaned up. And it's not easy to get it cleaned up. There's some tough days. There's some good days. There's victory days, but there's also tough days. It's like I was just telling Chris um, when I was in the Delta prison and uh, on my table when I was there for that weekend, I had one, one inmate there that was talking about his mom. His mom was... Uh, had Alzheimer's, but she was a heavy smoker. But her Alzheimer's, she forgot she smoked. And she came in and she got all mad. Whose cigarettes are these? Get these out of here. I don't want this smoking in this house again. She forgot that they were her cigarettes. So she never smoked again because she forgot she was a smoker. Because her memory told her she was a smoker. So her memory said, you need those. But when she forgot, whatever, whatever that was tied to that says, you're a smoker, when that got forgot, she didn't need them. They weren't a part of her psyche to need them. So when we start dealing with these things that cause us to react and do the things that we do, it's because it's tied to a memory. It's like I was telling Chris, and I had a conversation with somebody else about that, and this, this lady said, well, she was probably already anxious because of Alzheimer's, so she didn't really know, um, you know that, that it was the anxiousness for Alzheimer's, not the anxiousness for a cigarette. And I said, no. I said, she didn't start smoking because she was anxious. She started smoking because somebody introduced it to her. Probably just, oh, this, this is pretty cool, whatever, you know, when she was younger or whatever. So that's how she started. And then she reached a point in here where her mind told her she needed it. And so when she didn't have one, she was getting anxious because she didn't have one because her memory said, be anxious because you can't have one. Like that little baby not latching on to its mom 
because its memory said she doesn't want you. You might as well just die rather than be with somebody that doesn't want you. So the memory ties us to so many things that we do and we don't know. We don't even realize. That's why sitting here, it's not about information. It's about transformation. When you're in these chairs, the transformation that begins to happen is outside of your thoughts. It's outside of what you think you remember. Because some of this stuff that gets touched on, you have no memory of. But when the healing comes and the transformation begins to happen, you just are changed. You're different. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Doing good. All right. Let's go back to our paper here. That was a fun little nucleus uh, trip there. A little science. You know, going to get science today, did you? All right. But when you think about it, that's so small, but so powerful. And it's in everything. That force is in everything. Which means Christ is in everything. Um, it's just starting to recognize Him in all of creation. He is in all of creation. So, in Him, all things were created. In Him, all things were created. And apart from Him, nothing has been created. He is, Christ is creation. Christ is creation. In that day. Right? What's that? said, in that day. In that day what? You're going to realize. You're going to realize Ooh. that I am in my Father, and you are in me, humanity, and I am in you. In that day, you're going to realize that I am in my Father, creation, is in the Father, right? Father, creation is in the Father, and that Jesus for Christ is in us, in every atom. Christ is in every atom, creation. Creation is inside the Father, and Christ is inside everything in creation. There is no separation. You don't get away from Him. You don't run from Him. You can't hide from Him. There's no place to go that he is not there. Even the psalmist David wrote about that. He says, where can I go that you're not there? If I go into the depths of hell, you are there. Even the darkness is like light to you. Where can I go that you are not there? And what's interesting is they've discovered, scientists have discovered from what I have heard, that even in the darkness, there are particles of light in the darkness. And the, and the particles, and, the, and you think about it, it never gets fully black in the darkness. There's always light somewhere in the darkness. There's always hints of light. Okay, let's go back to our paper here. Genesis 1:26, 27. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, and in the image of God he created them, male and female, he created them. Created in this image. Created in this image. Ecclesiastics 3.11 He has made everything beautiful in his time. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. He has made everything Beautiful in its time. We think, well, that's not that's never gonna be beautiful. But yeah, everything gets made beautiful in its time. That's just amazing. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> he has also set eternity in the human heart. Right here. Eternity in the human heart. Eternity in the human heart. He has set eternity in the human heart. He's out here and he's in here. Your membrane, your body is holding your soul together. And Father, Spirit, and Son are right here. Eternity is right there in you. We're not going to go to eternity. Eternity is already here. We are already now in eternity. We just need to learn to start seeing what is instead of letting our imagination keep us from seeing what is. All right, let's go to 
second page, we're going to skip ahead just a little bit. And let's go to the, um, uh, uh, Acts 17.22 on the right-hand side of the page. Acts 17, you guys find it? All right. Acts 17, 22 through 28. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the uh, Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Where, does, where is his temple? In you. Yes. It's right here. He does not live in a temple built by human hands. We don't build him a temple out of bricks and stone and mud or straw or whatever. His, he already built his temple. He built his temple inside of humanity. So he's not uh, served by human hands as if he needed anything. That's interesting. As if he needed anything. If God has a need, right? Let's just go here for a quick second. If God has a need, whoever can fill that need is now God. Because now you have power over that God. Because so if he has a need for anything, if I can fulfill that need, I now have power over him. And I can manipulate him to do what I want him to do because I can fulfill his need. That's why God has no need. There's nothing you can do to fulfill his need because he has no need. He doesn't need your sacrifice. He doesn't need anything from you. But what he desires and likes is a relationship with you. Why? Because he's right here and he's in love with himself. He loves himself, so he is drawing himself to himself. The very fact that you are searching for God is actually God pulling you, causing you to search for God. That's God searching for God. That's God in you searching for God. That's why you have that desire to even look for God. That's called grace. Did we talk about grace yet? No. We will get to grace. We will get to grace. All right. Uh, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In Him we live and move and have our being. We are not out here anywhere trying to do our own thing and trying to figure out how to make it happen. We are already in Him. We live and move and have our being. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do this. Did this last time, I'm going to do it again. Where he says that, um, and from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. So let me try and help explain this a little bit further. So I put little buttons on you. So, one man. One man. He created one man. And then he marked out their times and their boundaries. So in this one man, we can go over here and say, 
There was Adam. Created Adam. And then out of Adam came some sons. And came some more. And so he marked out their time and their boundaries as they grow to fully fill this one man. It's hard to really explain it because we in our mind think we think linear. We think time, 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 time. But with God, there is no time. So with God, He sees the end from the beginning. So when He created one man, He already saw the finished. He already saw all of humanity. So He created and He, and he gave them each their appointed times and boundaries of where they would live. Their boundaries are within that one man. See, there's, there's nobody out here. Everybody is in that one man. And then he created the lineage that would eventually bring us to the cross where Jesus came into the earth. And then when that happened, because he is the head of the body, right? He is the head of the body. So when he came into the earth, what he did is he reached way down into the very bottom wherever Adam was lost. Adam was lost in his darkness. So he reached into it. It says he went, Jesus went into, um, went into death and went into Hades to set free the captives that were lost in their darkness. He went in and he totally turned right side out what was wrong side in. So I always picture it as a sock that turned wrong side in. He didn't just go a little ways and then start trying to pull the sock out. He went all the way down to the very bottom of that toe where Adam was lost. He went all the way back to the beginning of humanity. He went all the way. That's why there was the first Adam, and that's why he was the last Adam. He went all the way to where Adam was lost and then began pulling humanity back right side out so that the light would start shining in our darkness and we'd start learning our identity where we are as one humanity and we get so caught up fighting and arguing and with each other and nation against nation and all of that is wrapped around this right here this egoic mind that's always saying power and greed and I'm afraid of you. It says I don't understand you. I'm going to dehumanize you. And I'm going to say that you're not a real human being so I can treat you like crap. And that's what the egoic mind is. It's always eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's trying to always judge. If you're not just like me, you are less than me. You're not as good as me. If you're not just like me. Only two beliefs, right? What are they? My belief and the wrong belief. That's the egoic mind. It always says, if you're not just like me, then you're wrong. Not I might be wrong. No, just you're wrong. And so we destroy each other instead of seeing that what Christ did with all of creation, all of humanity, is all inside of that one man. That one man hasn't finished developing yet. It's continuing to unfold through time. Okay. Page three. And it was about two months ago, I woke up and actually I had a dream. And in that dream, what I saw was this person here and now was connected to that person then and there, presently. Both are living in connection to Papa's life and love. We're on page three, the top. Page three. You guys have the same handout I do? Page three. Do you guys find page three? Oh, you have the top right? Top left. Top left. Page three. Ours is altruistic. Move and have. Papa gave me a dream. Damn. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's been a long week. The person here and now was connected to the person then and there. So what I saw was really this person here, all right, was connected to the person over here, even if there was a thousand years difference between their time spans. 
between their time of being here in the, in the scene realm. They were connected. They were connected presently. What I really want us to get into our brains, which is hard to understand, is that with Father God, with Papa, there is no time. Only we regulate time. So we think once you cease to be in this realm, this age, you cease to be. But we don't cease to be. We continue in our relationship with everybody that's in here. We are all connected in here. All of creation connected. It's a snow globe. You see those little snow globes? If you're in a snow globe and you're one flake inside of a snow globe, is there anywhere that you're not connected to something else inside that snow globe? Always connected. Even it's the fluid that connects you, the, the very molecules and atoms, the, the nuclei that is in this one flake is connected to this water molecule and atom which is connected to this little building or this little snowman that's in the snow globe. Inside the snow globe everything is connected. <coughs> there is no outside of that. Everything is inside of that and connected. That's what we need to start realizing how connected we are to everything in creation. And the fact that you are created in their image with a mind, will, and emotions, you are the only creature that has mind, will, and emotions. To be able to think and plan and strategize. Now, there are animals like monkeys that have that, but they don't have the creative power that we do. That's what he gave us. That's why he said, go, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, take charge. Take charge of my creation. I'm giving it to you to take charge of. Now, make it someplace nice. I am in you to work with you, but I'm working with you to make it someplace. And then we get caught up in this, thinking that this no longer exists, and we're on our own to make it happen, and we let our egoic mind, our I am not, tell us and judge everything. And so we make decisions based because of our I am not glasses telling us what needs to be done. And we always make the wrong decisions. We dehumanize. We destroy. We have no respect for the rest of creation. We do that. The egoic mind does that. Okay. Let's go back to the, uh, page 3, left-hand side. Genesis 5, 23 and 24. Welcome back. <laughs> Genesis 5, 23 to 24. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more, because God took him away. Not dying, just stepping into the unseen realm. He was walking with God, and then God said, let's just put you in the other realm. He didn't stop walking with God. He continued walking with God. He just couldn't be seen anymore. Even Jesus, and there's, there's stories through the New Testament in Acts talking about how, um, who was it, Philip. Philip was taking a trip, heading to the town that the Holy Spirit told him to go to, and while he's walking over there, he hears this eunuch in a, in a carriage going by reading uh, the Old Testament scripture, and he couldn't understand it, some of the prophecies. And so Philip goes, oh, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? There's nobody to explain to me. So he said, hey, let me jump in the carriage with you. We'll go along, and I'll explain to you what was going on. Because this is when Jesus, he talked about the crucifixion, the resurrection, all that explained in the Old Testament. They come down from the ways, and the, the eunuch starts to really catch on. So he says, hey, there's some water right there. Is there any reason why I can't be baptized? Philip says, no. Why not? Let's go get you baptized. Go down, baptize him, dunks him in the water, and when the unit came up, Philip was gone and in a different city. He went, boom, right here, so he was now in a different city. He just bypassed time and distance and was in a different city. God has the ability to bypass time and distance because he's not bound to time and distance like we are. 
Jesus wasn't bound to time and distance. That's why he could keep reaching into that basket of fish and keep pulling out fish. And they're like, wow, where's the bottom of that basket? It's because he kept reaching in the basket. He wasn't bound to time and distance. He could have went back to the town, bought some more, came back, had a full basket again, and then he kept handing out. But when you're not bound to time and distance, you can just keep pulling because it's still there. There's no time and no distance. Right? <laughs> Michael, you're totally gone. Okay. There's so much to explore. You spend time here, this starts dealing with, and no longer are you bound by the limitations of what your mind is trying to tell you. But when you try and figure it out, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. So he can do more than what you can think or imagine to be done. Exceedingly abundantly more. Which means you're thinking and imagining this far out, and he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Let's go all the way over here. Let me do something over here that totally blows you away. Because you haven't thought, or thought about that far out, but you've got to allow yourself to be stretched. That's why we hold on to our truths like this. So he can move them and shape them and change them and change me while he's changing what I believe. We've got to let him change what I believe in order to experience more of him. As long as I keep holding on to, that's impossible. That can't be done. That's impossible. Then I'll never see it done. I'm always limited to my ability and what I believe. So I've got to let him change me. Okay. Sound good. All right. Hebrews 11.3 By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Hebrews 8.5 They serve in a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Remember the reflection kingdom? From a while back, kingdom, king, all the little guys, and it's all these little guys serving the king. Well, in this realm, in the realm of, of Christ, in the realm of Father God, in this realm of reigning, it's the king or the father serving all the people. And it's a reflection. And that's why we get it wrong. Because we've seen the reflection and we thought that we had it right. We had it upside down. It's like you look in the mirror, it's, you're trying to glue something on your face and it's on the other side of your face. You know, you ever, ever try to do that? <laughs> Poking yourself in the eye or whatever, you know? Don't give yourself a, your own haircut. You just can't do it. You're going to keep going forward and back and forward and back. It's because it's a reflection. It's a pattern, but it's a reflection. Okay. And remember what I said about reigning versus ruling. You guys remember that? Reigning is to be the very source of everything. So, in here, when we start letting go, his reigning starts becoming our source. Our source for peace, joy, satisfaction. Our source for everything that we continue when we're caught in this. We keep trying to find things that will make us satisfied. We look for those things that are going to make us satisfied. And you know what? They never do. Because they're not coming from the source. They are temporary satisfaction. And so what happens? We need more of them. We need to do it again. Well, I just bought this brand new car and I just absolutely love it. Six months from now, that feeling that I got and that joy and that awe that I had from that new vehicle, I don't feel that anymore. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and get another one. Because I'm chasing that feeling of joy and peace and anxiety, and uh, just exhilaration. But that is always short-lived unless I go here to the very source of joy and peace and exhilaration. If I'm not going to the source 
for my joy, the joy is temporary. It can't satisfy. Because only the source of joy can satisfy. Right? Making sense? I don't even look up to see if you know. I just keep going. First Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The unseen is revealed in the reflection of the seen. The natural reflects the spiritual. The state of the body and the unseen is revealed in the state of humanity, global society. So, when I begin to look at the problems in the world, I begin to analyze what does that look in the unseen realm, in the, in the heavenly realm. What did we do as a body of Christ, as a body, what have we not done that we should have been doing to change what's going on? So when I think about the body of Christ, I think of it here in this realm, in this unseen realm, and what we're doing with our face-to-face -face time, and what's going on there. Because whatever we're doing here, or even if it's not there, if it's in this, we are creating this. Even though it's in the unseen realm. You can't see the soul, but you can see the effects of the soul. You can't see love, but you can see the effects of love. So the unseen realm, and what's going on in the unseen realm, shows up in the seen realm. So if there's a lot of discontent and hate, then I know in the unseen realm of my soul, there's, a, there's a discontent, dissatisfaction. Something's wrong with where I'm going to for, for my source. Something's wrong. So that's how I look around. I look around at the world, and I do this quite often, and I look at what's, what's going on in society, I look at what's going on in this country, with whatever, the elections, the, the economy, all of that. And I say, what have we done in the unseen realm that is causing it to show up in the seen realm this way? What are we not doing in the unseen realm that's causing this seen realm to manifest this? Instead of looking at, well, this is going on, so something must be happening in the unseen realm. No. The seen realm is a reflection of the unseen realm. The seen reflects the unseen. The unseen doesn't reflect the seen. Does that make sense? So whatever's going on here is showing itself here. And it's not like, like we sometimes they, they look for the prophecy. And they say, whoa, this is happening because that's fulfilling the prophecy of that thing that was said. No, those prophecies have been fulfilled. What's happening is what are we currently doing? These two realms are connected right now, right now, right now. This isn't a one day, someday thing, and this is a now thing. They are both happening simultaneously at the same time. So when I know that, when I look at what's going on here that is disruptive and chaotic and, and a struggle, then I immediately go, what am I not doing here that's causing this to look like this? What am I not doing here that's causing this chaos in my life? Because I know it becomes, I need to step into that to start changing here. I need to step into this unseen realm to change here. And it's in this face-to-face -face where it happens. And it's not coming with my agenda, what I think needs changed. It's coming in a face-to-face -face with no agenda so that Father God and Spirit and Son can shape me with what needs to be done because I always misread what I think needs done. Well, if we just fix this, that would solve the problem. No. Actually, the problem goes further back than that. That's just another band-aid on the problem. We've got to get to the roots of the problem. And that's what they do in the face-to-face. -face. Okay. Altruistic. Bottom page on the left, page three. Triumph family are altruistic by nature. Altruism is not what they do, it's who they are. Whose shadow and shape are you created in? Theirs. What does the core of your being look like? Theirs. Kingdom versus family. You were created in a family to be a family. 
This, this is a family. That's a family. But we destroy each other because you don't look just like me, so you can't be a part of my family. You don't act just like me. You don't like the same things I like, so you can't be a part of my family. But there's only one human race. That's the family that we were created in. And at the core of your being, at the core of your being, is the same thing that they are. Love, altruism, give, 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 give. Be in that source, at the core of your being. That's whose image you were made in. You were made to be that way. But what happens, here comes hurt and pain and confusion and fear and things happen to us. And so this core gets snuffed because it can't filter through all the crap to get out. And we become very protective of who we are. And we can't just open up and be altruistic because there's too much pain involved in that. So that's why sitting in the chairs in the face-to-face -face is when this starts to be dealt with, and as this starts to be dealt with, the altruistic and the love starts coming to the surface easier, quicker. It starts coming quicker to the surface. It doesn't take us three days or a week to get over a situation. We can get over a situation that goes up, doesn't go our way in just an hour. Ten minutes. We can walk away and go, ah, okay, I'm over it. All right, I'm over that. Move on. Now I'm free to enjoy the moment. I'm free to trust the moment. Instead of trying to control the moment because I'm afraid, I can trust the moment. You guys doing okay? Is everyone doing okay? All right. Lawrence, we're going to put you in this hot seat right here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, God is love. 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Isn't that interesting? Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. It doesn't say nothing about a prayer that you prayed. It doesn't say nothing about a church service you went to. What's it say? Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. In this love... Oh, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. And sent His Son to be the propitiation. Propitiation is a very tough word. Uh, it has to do with extinguishing the guilt. The atonement. When you see that word atonement, remember it. Remember, it's at one meant. He came to bring unity and oneness. He came so that in that day you would realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's why he came. That's why he came for that. It wasn't, and this might stir you up a little bit, but it wasn't to be a sacrifice to this God so that he could look at us again. Because if this God can't handle us because of sin and he needs a sacrifice to be able to handle us then that means he has a need and if he has a need whoever fills that need is now God he doesn't have a need he didn't need the sacrifice we needed the sacrifice so that we would feel better about turning our face to God Sacrifice was going on long before Abraham was asked to go sacrifice his son Isaac. That was their tradition. That was their way of being in the Chaldeans. That's what they did. So when Abraham said, come on Isaac, let's go. I'm going to sacrifice you. Isaac was like, that's what we do. That's how we live. And that's when God stepped in and said, nope, we're changing how you live. I want to show you something. I'm going to be your sacrifice. You need a sacrifice, I'm going to be that for you. Very powerful if he doesn't have a need. And what changed when, Je when Christ, when Jesus died on that cross, there were things done, but it wasn't to pay off a father, an angry father. I'll just say this. If we were to go to a country down like New Guinea or something, uh, some place where they have lava, some, some, some island where they have volcanoes and stuff, and if they were to take a virgin up into the volcano and throw her into the volcano 
to appease an angry God so we have good crops, we would call that a very bad religion. Well, what's the difference between throwing a virgin in a volcano to appease an angry God or hanging a virgin on a cross to appease an angry God? What's the difference? It's the exact same religion. So that's why we need to get out of our mindset that Jesus died to pay off a debt to Father God. Father God didn't think we owed him anything. We did. But what Jesus did do, the wages of sin is death. Sin had a payment that was due. So Jesus paid death off and he destroyed it. So he's on the cross, hanging on the cross, and he's breathing his last breath. And death's there going, mocking him, aha! I got you, I got you, I got you. And death, like right in his face, I got you. And Jesus is there, and he goes, nope, I got you. He had to die in order to get death and destroy death. The book by Athanasius really explains it very well. That's why it took me and two other guys a year to go through that book. It's only 87 pages long, but it is so rich on explaining what really happened and why Jesus had to come, and it wasn't to pay off an angry God. That's not why he came. He did come to set things in right. He said, and he created in himself one new humanity. He came to turn the sock inside out, to bring reality back to our minds and our hearts and our beings. That's why he came. Are we going to throw stones at me? No. No. I'm just telling you, hold your hand like this. <laughs> Put those stones down. Hold your hand like this. And I'm not telling you to believe that. I'm telling you this is what I discovered and it's something for you to think about and chew on. If this God needed a sacrifice, then whoever provided that sacrifice now has control of that God. And that's why the Apostle Paul told the, those guys in Athens, he doesn't need anything. He's the source of everything. He doesn't have a need. We have the need. So he stooped to our level to come down and communicate with us about our need so he could win our relationship back with him. Okay, God is love. So that was all about atonement for our sins. It's a very bad theology going on about that. The atonement theory, it's a very bad theology. Uh, so verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Wow. Where there is love, there is God. Period. Where there is love, there is God. Period. I don't care if you pray to prayer or not. Where there is love, there is God. There is God. Okay. First uh, John 4.19 We love because he first loved us. Whose love do we love with? His. We can't love. We can't love our neighbors. We can't love each other. Because in this, there is no love except for self. So it's his love here that begins to love others. It's his love that loves. Not ours. Because he is love. We are just those that allow it to flow through us to them. We are where the unseen realm flows through to the seen realm. We are that. We are this right here. We're that point right there where the unseen realm touches the seen realm. That's who we are. That's where we are. That's how important you are in the cosmos. You are where that flows through. Whatever. That's why Jesus says, I only do what I see my Father doing. He put that where he was allowing that to flow through him into all of creation. I only say, I say what I hear my father saying. He allowed the Father to flow through him into all of creation. Okay. All right, we're doing good. Uh, you, humanity, or humanity, made in the image and likeness, shadow and shape of Father, Son, and Spirit. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. <laughs> Let us make man in our image. Humanity was male and female before they were separate. Oneness. Unity. Oneness. A trinity of trinities created in the image and likeness of the trinity. 
family relationship. What did Jesus say in John 14, 20? Here. In that day, you're going to realize that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. In that day, you're going to realize that I'm you, I am in you, you are in the Father, and I am in you. There's, there's that oneness, that unity, that, that union. So valuable. One, oneness, union, unity. Okay, page four. Finally, yay. How many spirits are there? How many faiths are there? Well, let's don't guess. Let's find out. Ephesians 4, 2 through 7. I, therefore, a prisoner of the, for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We're on page 4, left-hand side. Here we got it. Walk in a manner for which you have been called with all human or humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of how many? All. All. Who is over how many? All. And through all. all. And in all. How many is all? all. It's all. <laughs> it is all of humanity. Mm. It is all of humanity. We are a part of the big picture. We are a part of the plan from before creation was founded. We've been a part of that. Whether we knew it or not, we have been a part of that plan. Yes, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace has given, was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Why do we cry at weddings? Because of the union and the oneness. We see that in the beginning, God made male and female. He, he, he separated Eve from Adam. So when a wedding happens, it's bringing them back together. It's that union again that reminds us of family, that puts our hearts right here, that we begin to feel this love for union and togetherness and oneness. And it begins to flow through us to where we start. And I'm telling you, you start spending time here and allowing that face-to-face -face time to start happening. It's going to change you. It's going to change the way you see things. It's going to change how you how you, how you love creation. It's going to change things. Okay. Uh, what is grace? Grace is charis. Graciousness of manner or act. Especially the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. Simply said, grace is God in you doing what you don't have the ability to do. Grace is God in here helping you to do what you don't have the ability to do. You don't have the ability to love your neighbor. You don't have the ability to love your neighbor. But God's grace, His influence on your heart coming forth in your actions, that's grace. That's His grace. For it is by grace that you are saved. Oh, right there. Ephesians 2, 8-10. through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith or trust. And this not from yourselves. Your salvation was about you. It was what Jesus did. And the influence of the Holy Spirit in your heart that has been moving you closer and closer to a relationship. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's God's handiwork, not ours. We can't trust Him by our own power. It is His grace in us that is helping us to trust Him. It is His faith in us that lets us trust Him. Every day that you wake up, He works to earn your trust. Not because He has done anything wrong, but you just don't trust Him. We have been pre uh, preconditioned with threats 
of eternal fire for not trusting Him. Right? How many times have you heard that? So we've been threatened to love Him or He's going to forever turn His back on you and you're going to forever burn in a fire. And you go, well, I better love Him then because I don't want to be in the fire. But you know what? You may love Him, but you never trust Him. There are two ways to trust or to be obedient. Actually, there's two ways to be obedient. One is out of fear and the other is out of love. And we will never be brought to completion out of fear. 1 John tells us that. 1 John 4. We will never be brought to completion out of fear, only out of love. There's only two ways that we can learn to be obedient to what he's telling us to do. And that is either by love or by, or by uh, fear. And if we're afraid of him, we will never love him enough to fully trust him. Yeah, we'll do what he says as long as he's looking. But as soon as I get over here in this dark shadows by myself, well, I don't think he's looking, well, then I'm going to do my thing. I had a friend, my mentor, told me that when he was growing up, that he was the guy, he was that kid, that when his dad told him to sit down and shut up, he goes, physically, I sat down, but inside, I was still standing. It's like, yep, I can relate to that. I may do it physically, but in here, I'm still not doing it. If we have a fear of this God, we may do it physically, but inside we're still not doing it. We're still not loving Him with our whole heart and our whole being. We're still not obeying what He says. Only when He's watching or when people that know Him are watching me, then I'm going to do it. But I'm not doing it because I love Him. I'm doing it out of fear. And as soon as nobody's watching, I'm doing my own thing again. And so he wants us to come to a relationship where we trust him because of love and we do it out of love. And what happens when that love begins to flow through us? It begins to change. And now we're not doing it out of fear. We're not doing it because we have to. We're doing it because I don't feel like doing that stuff anymore. That's not who I am anymore. I'm a different person now. That's the love that begins to change us. But as long as we don't trust him, we'll never let him change us. Okay, Psalms 139, 13 through 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. See? You set the boundaries and their seasons, their times. <coughs> Here. Before one of them came to be. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's powerful. Chose us in him before the creation. <laughs> it's just it's good. Uh, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So John 15, 16. Here's the question. Did you choose Christ or did Christ choose you? John 15, 16 says it. Jesus is talking. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Now let me tell you, when he says whatever you ask in my name, he's not saying put a Ta da! At the end of your prayer. In Jesus' name. Ta da! Presto! Let it be. Ta da! That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. Because when you are here in his name, the only thing that you begin to ask for are those things that change the people around you. 
you began to ask for his will be done, not your will be done. If you come with your laundry list of things that you want uh, for your stocking on Christmas, well, that's you trying to find satisfaction and joy in something that's only temporary. But when you come in this face-to-face -face in his name, you find yourself not even asking for anything. Just to love him and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, back on, back up on the Psalms. Um, uh, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You have underneath there. What book could David be referring to? Yeah. And that's the book of life. That would be the book of life, exactly. That's the book of life. So, well, there's a lot of conversation about getting your name in the book of life. But David says, my name was written there before I was born. So we're not doing anything to get our name written in the book of life. It's there. He put it there. He put it there. And I know last time we had this conversation, it came up about your name getting blotted out of the book of life. And so I did do some research on that. And um, in Exodus 32, 33, um, God did say, because he, in Exodus 32, this is when Moses went up on the mountain, and the kids didn't want to go up. Children Israel didn't want to go up with them. They got to the foot of the mountain, they got scared. And they said, no, you go, you go, Moses, and then you come back and tell us what he said. Well, Moses went up on the mountain, and then he was gone for a while. And then they all got freaking out about, he's never coming back, whatever. And so they end up uh, building, uh, and poor Aaron, yeah, she went. He said, well, they were asking for uh, somebody to worship, and we needed somebody to worship. So I took all of their gold, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. And we started worshiping. Yeah, right, Aaron. <laughs> you just threw it in the fire, and out came this calf, this golden calf, and we began to worship. You know, somebody built the mold, and they worked hard on it. But So when Moses comes back down the mountain, he hears all this chaos going on. And he's thinking like it's a battle, but it's not a battle. He realizes they're just partying and going crazy. A, a rave, worse than a rave, just wild, crazy, uh, going crazy. So Moses gets mad and he throws down the tablets and broke all Ten Commandments at once. So he broke them all. And then he went and he told, um, he told Aaron, he said, who is going to serve the Lord? And the Levites came up. And he said, take a sword, and I don't care if they're your brother, your mother, I don't care who they are, you go and you slice them if they're, are, if they're going crazy like this. So they did. They went and they boom, boom, killed 300, 500, I can't remember how many people they killed. 1,000, I don't know. It was, a, it was a, a number. He went and they went and killed them all. So then Moses went to go talk to, to God, and he says, you know, um, if they've sinned against you, blot my name out of your book. See, See Moses knew about the book, too. And Moses said, blot my name out of the book. And God says, now, you just listen to what I'm telling you. If they sin against me, I'll blot their name out. It's kind of like how sibling rivalry kind of thing going on. And when it goes to tell, and then um, Moses is like, you know what? I'm just going to go tell Dad that they're acting this way, but punish me instead. And Dad says, no, I got it handled. Go back, do what you're supposed to go do. I'll punish him myself. And it wasn't like he was going to, but he had to satisfy Moses to get him to go and start being obedient again. Because Moses was going to be the Savior. And Moses couldn't be the Savior. So it was, God on so many levels always comes down to our level of where we are. Wherever you are in your relationship, he comes to that level to meet you there. Like when I play with my grandson when he was young, get down on his level, play his game. Like Jill always do with our granddaughter. Play her little three marker challenge and play their game on their level. And then as they grow, the game changes. And so you don't go back and keep playing that goo goo ga ga game because they've outgrown that. So as they grow, how you relate to them changes. 
That's the same way Father God, because he is a good parent. That's what he does with us. He comes to the level we're at to try and help us to grow and learn and mature. And as we learn and mature, he starts dealing with us differently on a different level of maturity. So if you're still back, goo goo ga ga, feed me, and you've been walking with him or having him in your life for 15 years, you're not growing. That means you're putting no effort into growing. You're still being immature. You're one of those people still pooping your diapers or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, and he, he says, we got to grow up. He didn't, he didn't put us here to remain immature. He put us here to grow up and have this unseen realm begin to affect this seen realm. If we're not growing up in the unseen, we are still creating chaos in the scene. And we could just become a part of the problem instead of a part of the solution that he's called us to do. Isn't that what he said? Um, yes, over Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 on the left-hand side. Whereas by grace you have been saved through faith, trust, and this is not for yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so no one can boast. For we are God's handwork, creating Christ Jesus to do what? Good, work. Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God prepared in advance for things for you to do. But if you're still pooping your diapers and not doing your homework and not spending your time, you're not doing what he's prepared for you to do. He's not going to throw you out. He's not going to hit you upside the head and knock you over. He will allow things to happen in your life that will cause you misery. Until you get tired of your life being there. Until you get so tired of who you become. And that's exactly what happens. We get tired of who we become. How did Jesus defeat death? By submitting to it. Because he could have taken himself off that cross at any time. And he even said, you don't take my life. I lay it down. So he defeated death. And that's, who he, that's why he died. To defeat death. Not pay off a father. So how did he defeat death? By submitting to it. How does he defeat our ego? By submitting to it. And we get so wrapped up in our ego until our life just becomes, I'm just so sick of my life. And he says, you ready for change? We go, yeah, I'm ready for change. Anything's better than this. And then we start to change. Then we start getting serious about our change. Let then we start, the boat. we start letting go of the boat. We stop trying to control everything. We stop trying to be afraid and, and, and make all these wrong decisions. Right. All right. Thank Colossians, you. you bet. Good, good call. Good way to go back. We're going to wrap up this verse right here. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the divine, this is a passion translation, which I really like. He is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God, and the firstborn heir of all creation. For in him was created the universe of things, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth. All that is seen and all that is unseen. That pretty much sums up everything, right? Every seat of power, realm of government, principality, and authority. It all exists through him and for whose purpose? His. His purpose. He existed before anything was made, and now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of his body, which is the church. And since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, he is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. And by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and on earth is what? Brought back to himself, back to its original intent restore to innocence again. That was the purpose of the cross. Not to appease an angry God, but to restore everything back to its original intent because it was lapsing, as Athanasius says, it was lapsing back into non-being. It was, it was decaying into a nothingness again. It was going back into the dust because of what God had created to be and they turned when they turned from God, they no longer took direction here. They only took direction here, and that began to close things off, and they began to lapse back into a non-being existence, a death existence. So Jesus came, and Athanasius says it on the cross. 
So why does it have to be a cross? Because then he was bringing those that were far and those that were near together in one body. Why wasn't he just cut in half like some of the other martyrs were? Because if he was cut in half, then the body would have been divided. Why was he lifted up on the cross? Because he had to be lifted up in order to bring all into that realm. So much happened on that cross that we haven't begun to explore of what really took place on that cross. But it was not to get this guy to turn back around. It was in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, the cosmos, all of creation, back to himself. He wasn't reconciling himself to the cosmos. He was turning the cosmos back to himself because we had wandered away doing our own thing. Okay. I love that last line. Verse 20, And by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and on earth, everything in heaven and on earth is brought back to himself. Back to its original intent. Restored to innocence again. That is powerful. Praise God. Let's pray. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit, for being with us. Let us enjoy this time with you. So good. So good. So good. So rich. Help us to uh, not try and hold our beliefs with such tight hands that we miss what you're saying, but help us to walk in the freedom of letting go, of just letting go of everything that we think we know, everything we think we understand, that you can mold, shape us, change us, form us, bring us back to our original intent, bring us back to our original identity, set us free from those things that bind and tie, those memories that hold us captive, bring healing into us. Lord, I ask that you will put in us and that your grace be sufficient in us to have each one of us begin to find our time, our moment, our, our five minutes, our ten minutes, our twenty minutes of just face-to-face -face time, of letting go of, of things on our agenda, letting go of our stresses, letting go of our worries, letting go of anything that we would try and hold in front of you. Help us to just let go and fall back in trust. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be the light in our darkness. Thank you, Jesus. Through Christ. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Was that quite the trip? That's quite the trip. It's a lot to chew on, but it's good stuff. <laughs>